Hi, everybody. Uh, we're ready to start the, the webinar. So uh, <clears throat> this webinar uh, in series that we're doing is about kind of like how to set up ELK in, in five minutes using Logs.io. And uh, I'm going to take you through a little bit of an explanation of what we do and then what does it take to set up ELK uh, in production and uh, and also be able to uh, show you kind of like a demo of how you set it up in our system and as, as a comparison. So um, hi, everybody. My name is Asaf, and I am the co-founder and the vice president of product for Logs.io. Um, you see here my contact info. So if at any point you would like to contact me either during or after the webinar, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, if you do have questions throughout the webinar, please uh, submit them through the questions uh, options, and I will uh, uh, answer all of them at the end once once finished uh, the presentation. So thank you very much for joining. Um, like I said for the agenda, we're going to do a short intro into ELK. I'm sure most of you know uh, what ELK is. Uh, talk a little bit about us, uh, and then explain what does it take to set up ELK on your own. Uh, and then show you how to set up ELK um, in five minutes using uh, Logs.io. Uh, the, the main uh, purpose of this webinar is to go through what we've released as the ELK apps, which is uh, it's a complete app store for uh, the ELK stack um, applications, which are visualizations, alerts, um, um, dashboards, and, uh, and saved searches. So I'm going to walk you through this, show you how to install them, how to get from from zero to be able to have a dashboard very, very quickly. So a quick introduction to ELK. So ELK uh, is obviously a combination of three open source products, Elasticsearch, uh, which is a schemaless database, uh, very highly scalable, high performant, um, that acts as the, as the database for the whole system. And it's basically the core of the, of the ELK stack. Uh, Logstash, which is the streaming data ingestion, it, uh, uh, it does time normalization, it had field enhancement, field extraction, and all sorts of things with uh, different plugins. Uh, and Kibana, which is the visualization layer. Right now, um, we're working on Kibana 4.2 with uh, at Logs.io, uh, which is, is, I know a lot of people are still using Kibana 3 for this, but this is a big improvement uh, if you move to Kibana 4. So ELK is uh, is the number one in, in user adoption for log analytics. So it has more companies than all the other proprietary tools combined. So if you take companies like uh, Splunk or Sumo Logic or other companies, uh, they don't amount to the amount of users that are using a single platform, which is uh, which is ELK. Uh, it has uh, roughly 500,000 monthly downloads of the stack. Um, uh, have a very huge and vibrant community all over the world that's doing meetups and forums and uh, helping one another, developing and contributing to uh, to this great project. Um, this also is a product that's being used by Netflix, by Bloomberg, like some other companies like Facebook um, uh, and uh, Cisco are also using it. Um, if you go to Elasticsearch website, uh, there's a lot of uh, a very interesting presentation from all of these companies. How did they set up? They set up their ELK um, stack internally, and uh, but it's very widely used from small companies to huge companies with uh, with a lot of data. The big advantages of ELK is that it's uh, simple and beautiful. Uh, if you look at the Kibana visualization, you see it's very nice. Uh, you can do a lot with it. Uh, it's also open source, which means that if you take care of the hardware, you can actually use it for free. You don't have to pay for it. Uh, it's fast. It's very fast, uh, and it's very scalable if you know how to do it. It's it's a little bit of a challenge, uh, to say the least, to be able to run and maintain a huge cluster of the ELK, but it is doable. Uh, the, the disadvantage is that this is not production ready. This stems from the fact that this is an open source product. Um, or a combination of three different open source products, um, you would have to make sure that versioning are OK uh, and being able to set it up in production is, uh, is a challenge. It's also hard to scale. So even though it is scalable, it takes a lot of knowledge of knowing how to scale each and every component separately. So you would need to take care of scaling of Elasticsearch, scaling of Logstash, scaling of the, uh, of the Kibana if needed, and, and so forth. It also doesn't come with any pre-built security, so it's completely open to the world. 
Um, and uh, if you do want to use it in production, if you wasn't you want to use it internally, then you would have to take care of all of this and uh, implement uh, role-based access and stuff like that. Uh, a little bit about Logs.io. So Logs.io, uh, what we provide is we provide an end-to-end -end solution with ELK. So we provide an enterprise-grade uh, ELK that is being run as a cloud service, which means you sign up on the website, uh, you ship logs, and we have a lot of ways of shipping logs, and that's all you need to do. You don't need to take care of uh, setting it up. You don't need to take care of scaling it. You don't need to take a versioning upgrades and stuff like that. Basically, uh, it works. Uh, we also have uh, additional actionable of insight, which uh, rely on advanced analytics that are built on machine learning that we run in our. Uh, uh, it's kind of a core competence that we do, and this is also part of uh, part of what Logs.io does. Basically, an end-to-end -end log analytics solution, cloud service that is uh, uh, that is completely ELK. Um, our, so our enterprise the great ELK is up and running in minutes. Like I said, you need to sign up. It takes about a minute to sign up. Uh, it's infinitely scalable. You can send one gig a day. You can send one terabyte a day. You can send five terabytes a day. Uh, things are uh, completely scalable and completely independent of the user. Uh, it is production ready, so we spend a lot of time and energy on making sure that it's uh, uh, it's uh, it, it's secure. It's designed for production. Uh, we monitor it obviously all the time. We've also implemented features and functionality that are not part of the ELK stack. So features like alerts, uh, features like advanced security, uh, and uh, and the whole concept of high availability that we've implemented into the into the ELK stack. I want to spend a few minutes on kind of guiding how to take ELK uh, and install it on your own, and uh, and so. If you just want to prototype ELK, this is a relatively simple task. Um, you, it's going to take you about an hour to install the whole ELK stack on a server. So downloading all the Elasticsearch logs to Shinkibana, the latest versions, and making sure that they match and setting up on a server. Uh, shipping one log file is also uh, um, kind of like a relatively easy task you can achieve. Um, then you'd have to go and configure Logstash to do the log parsing for you. So if you send Apache logs or you send MySQL logs or anything like that, you would have to go in and, and build that log parsing. It's not a simple task, but it is uh, it is doable. Uh, and then uh, building Kibana dashboard is also, if you've done this before and you know how to do it, it's a simple task, but it could take a few hours to be able to get a handle of it and be able to install the Kibana dashboard. So. All in all, just to get to a prototype version, it's going to take you roughly a little bit less than a day to be able to ship the logs, to be able to visualize them um, and parse them correctly and stuff like that. So that's that seems like a very simple task. But the next challenge is like, how do we take ELK and turn it production ready? So uh, again, I want to spend a few minutes just uh, very briefly on the on on how how to do it. Uh, kind of like for your own use as a reference and then show you what you what we do So I'm going to talk separately about the three components. Uh, the main component is obviously Elasticsearch. So uh, These are the tasks that you need to be to make sure that happen in order to make it production ready So first thing is you need to do an OS level optimization Elasticsearch out of the box comes with um, pretty good uh, pre-configured uh, uh, Parameters, but you need to also adjust it to your specific environment um, you need to implement index management. So uh, because uh, you cannot really easily delete data from Elasticsearch and you know log data, if you want to use it for log analytics, is the streaming data. Let's say you want to have seven days retention. That means that you need to make sure that Elasticsearch create a new index every day and that you run a curator to delete or optimize uh, the old indices. Uh, you need to implement shard allocation. The shard allocation in Elasticsearch is depending on the performance that you want to get. It's a little bit tricky, but it's not undoable. Um, the next thing is to do zone awareness, especially if you're running with AWS, you want to make sure that you achieve high availability. And one way to do it is to use the AWS plugin for Elasticsearch. It makes sure that if you do a replica shard, it, it uh, uh, it configures the shard on a, on a different availability zone and basically gives you the availability uh, that you want. 
Uh, next thing, you need to optimize the bulk inserts. So the default API, the REST API to Elasticsearch uh, um, inserts every message, at, one message at a time. There is a bulk API that you can leverage and being able to um, optimize the bulk size is also very important. It depends on the latency that you want to achieve because the bulk is going to get accumulated until you reach that certain number and only then be uh, flushed into Elasticsearch. Um, and the last thing is you need to understand the cluster topology. So you need to build, uh, if you want a high availability, you need to build three uh, master nodes uh, from Elasticsearch so you wouldn't run into the split brain issue that, that happens if you don't. Uh, you need to understand how many data nodes, you need to understand how many client nodes are needed. Um, and there's a lot of work that, that needs to be done on that. All that work is is other maybe than the OS level optimization, is work needed whether you install Elasticsearch on your own or if you're using a third-party hosted Elasticsearch. So if you're using uh, a found.no or using uh, um, the Amazon web server, the Amazon, the AWS uh, hosted Elasticsearch, you would still have to go uh, um, to do the index management. You would still have to do the shard allocation. You would still have to do the bug optimization. You would still have to do the side of the cluster topology. Uh, it does save you from the OS level optimization and zone awareness, which are, are pre-built into this. The next component is Logstash. Um, uh, it's also a little bit of a complicated uh, component to be able to manage. So one of the critical things is to be able to make sure that you have proper data parsing into it. Um, and the second thing is to be able to, to scale it accordingly. So um, be able to do this uh, high availability. Logstash is a, is a stateless uh, service, but it does contain a uh, kind of a queue with messages. So be able to create a highly available Logstash uh, uh, is a challenge because this is not cluster, cluster ready. Uh, if you're using it for log analytics, like we do, the burst protection is very critical. So as you probably can assume, logs are pretty standard, but then when, when there is a problem with the system, then the log become very, very noisy and bursty, and uh, you would need to front Logstash usually with a buffer to accumulate the logs and allow Logstash to read from them. So either using Redis or using Kafka, uh, and there are plenty other um, scenarios where you can use it. Uh, configuration management. Um, so the configuration for Logstash can only be done once Logstash is offline. So let's say you want to change the data parsing or you want to change any filtering or you want to add anything to Logstash, you would have to change the configuration and restart it. While you restart it, you run a risk of losing logs. So if you want to, if you care about log losing, then you would need to be able to run Logstash in a way that you can make configuration on the fly without the loss of data. Uh, and the last thing, which is also it's something that a lot of people are disregarding, but it's rejections from Elasticsearch. So even though Elasticsearch uh, is a schemaless database, um, that means that if Logstash pushes a value that one time the same field is an int integer and the second time the, the field is a string, the second insert will get rejected. Uh, and the reason is they get rejection is because Elasticsearch by default sets the type by the first time it encounters the fields, unless you specify it uh, uh, explicitly. So be able to capture these exceptions of the log parsing, be able to handle it properly, uh, what things that we've done. And uh, so this is also challenging if you want to rely on the ELK stack for production, because you don't want to miss um, a high percentage of your logs. And from statistics that we run about one to 3% of the logs are being rejected by Elasticsearch for various reasons. Uh, last component, uh, obviously, is, uh, is uh, Kibana. So uh, um, this is probably one of the easiest components to be able to set. So it is also stateless. It only works with Elasticsearch. Uh, setting security um, and role-based access is, is a challenge, but there are plenty of resources out there if you want to front it with Nginx and do basic security. Setting it up for high availability, uh, again, I mean, if you are running on Amazon, you're setting a load balancer, you're setting uh, Kibana behind it, it's not uh, it's not something difficult, but it takes the time. Um, there are some functionality which is missing from Kibana, so if you do want to implement alerts, you would have to write code that, that does it. Uh, if you do want to uh, create dashboards, so you can create, you need to create kind of like pre-canned dashboard, 
Um, and obviously, anomaly detection is, is also not not something which exists in the default uh, Kibana uh, installation. So all in all, if you did a prototype by about a, by about one day, and you make sure that it works for you. Turning the ELK to production takes about four weeks of work, um, and you end up having between ten and fifteen servers, depending on your environment, because you need to run master nodes and you need to run the, uh, the data nodes and you need to run uh, stuff for Logstash servers and you need to run Kibana and you need to run Nginx and you need to run Redis or Kafka in the front. So you end up with quite a lot of servers. And uh, that also require monitoring. So now you have a log analytic system that comprises of a lot of moving components, and you need to run a monitoring system to be able to monitor that log analytic system. So this is roughly about four weeks of work to be able to get it up and running for production ready. And uh, one of the critical things here is that the, because this is open source, a lot of the projects are moving very, very quickly. So you would end up yourself within about a month or so uh, quite far behind on the version that you've set. So uh, this also require you to be able to upgrade. From our experience, every upgrade takes between two days and a week, depending on uh, the amount of loads that you have. Upgrading a, a cluster while you're running stuff into it and upgrading log stashing, making sure that everything works and uh, any configuration changes and backward compatibility is working is not something which is, uh, which is simple or easy to do. So, uh, um, so uh, a little bit about Logs.io in, in the same process of getting to a production system grade ELK with Logs.io is, is something that can be done within less than five minutes. So uh, all you need to do is register for an account. Um, you register for an account online and, uh, and ship logs. We have a lot of ways of shipping logs, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, adding visualization dashboards and alerts. This is something that can take time and expertise, but for that we've added the ELK apps, which I'm going to take you through it and show you exactly how we do stuff and and uh, um, and how you can take advantage of it. So uh, I'm going to switch my screen now. So this is the this is the the Kibana and. Uh, this is uh, this is the Kibana, and this is how uh, how this looks like. Um, just want to take you so so this is Logs.io. After I register, the registration is you need to fill in like email and password and name, and that's it. Uh, there are a lot of ways to be able to ship logs to uh, to Logs.io, uh, and in this example, what I've set up, uh, what I'm setting up is two different things. One of them is uh, uh, I'm setting up shipping. Uh, Apache files using using a file, so just curling up a file uh, into the listener, and I'll show you in a minute how I'm going to do it. And the second thing is the MySQL, and what we've done with MySQL, we're also developed a Docker container, um, and we're using uh, we're using on our own server, we're using uh, MySQL, we're using RDS. So we've implemented a Docker container that takes care of all the different things you can actually get from MySQL. So it reads the slow, uh, slow query logs and it uh, runs JMX to get status information. Uh, and all that information is, uh, is being collected and pushed to the ELK stack that you have. I think there's like four or five different log types that, that are being pushed. And all this documentation is, uh, is on our website. As you can see, this is about, I don't know, one command that you need to do, you need to download the Docker, run Docker run, um, and, and that's it. So uh, this is, uh, this is uh, that's what I'm gonna show you. But first thing first, so I wanna show a little bit about uh, file upload. And uh, so I have this example here. Uh, if I can just, if I just take it and I run it here, um, you can see that I have a file which already have uh, uh, Apache access log files, and I'm just going to curl it into the to the URL that uh, that we have. And uh, this is going to take probably about a minute because I have a file here, but I am going to have all the data in my, uh, in my Elasticsearch. So yeah, so the, the operation is done, and you can see that I can go to my Elasticsearch, uh, look at the Kibana, and I have now 
if I look type uh, Apache access. I have all the log file that I just shipped with it. Um, you can see that all the fields are already broken up. So what logs.io does is we take the message, which is raw message, and we implement all the different grocks and files and, and enhancement and filtering that need to be done per specific type. So you only need to tell that this is Apache Access, and uh, obviously we support a lot of types that, that can, be, can be seen on our website. And uh, we break out uh, the geolocation, and we can, we break out the response codes, and we can break up uh, anything that exists uh, in here. So the next thing that I want to do is is uh, let's say I want to be able to I want to run a pres I want to run and build a visualization. So um, if I want to build a visualization on my own, I can uh, I can go to uh, let's say I want to run a visualization for Apache Access. I want to run here and I want to create a visualization and I'm going to do a line graph and I'm going to do type Apache access and I'm going to set the x-axis to be the date so it's already pre-filled um, so I can see the dates and, and I'm going to set I'm going to have another uh, x-axis I'm going to split the lines by uh, term and I'm going to do the response code status and look at how this name is is uh, being presented here it's the response code so response Visualize. Add another one. Split the lines. Use term. Response. Oh, I don't see the response. Uh, oh, sorry. It's uh, it's one of the numbers here. So here's the response time. So. I filtered by response, and I have right now everything is a response 200. But if I look at, uh, let's say, 12 hours back, I can see that I have 400 and 200. Uh, one of the cool things I can do in this case is you see it's not very useful that this, I obviously don't have a lot of 404s, but I can go to the option and make it a logarithmic graph. And now I can see a little bit more information uh, um, about this. The other thing, uh, the other thing I can do is I can also go and add metric to the y-axis, and I want to increase the dot size and have it be by the uh, maximum um, and of bytes that I'm getting through the system. So you can see that very, very uh, it looks very easy, but but uh, I have a lot of knowledge on how things work on uh, on Kibana and how to make it work and how to build like one single visualization. Now imagine that you have to build I don't know, 10 or 15 or 20 of them. That would take quite a lot of time. So for that, we've implemented the ELK apps. So uh, since we have Apache data here, all I need to do is say, I want to look for Apache dashboard. Uh, and we have Apache dashboard here. And you can read a little bit about it. It's kind of some valuable information about this. Um, and all you need to do is click Open. And you already get that dashboard downloaded into your system and working and populated with all the data. So this dashboard, for someone who is not experienced with Kibana and with the ELK stack and how to build visualization, it's probably going to take about a couple of days to build. Uh, and you get it here with less than five minutes from the moment I sent the files or I sent the data in. Everything is already parsed, already presented. The dashboard is live. Everything is working without me having to do any uh, any additional work on my end. So this is an example of, of uh, the dashboard. Um, other things that we have here. So uh, I told you we also have like MySQL that we uh, um, that uh, we're shipping logs and. Um, I can pick up like even I can pick up a visualization in here of stuff that I want to see. Like for example, 
uh, I want to see the number of, of users accessing the system. I can open it up and uh, this goes and kind of scan the MySQL and kind of counts the number. So here I can see that there are four people uh, accessing the system right now at any given point of time. I think, again, there is a lot of dashboards and visualizations that we provide that, uh, um, that are very valuable and make you enable you to get from zero system, like have nothing in your environment, to be able to get to a fully functional log analytic system with dashboard and alerts and everything uh, within a matter of, uh, of a few minutes. Uh, I want to show you a few other apps that, uh, that we have here. Obviously, we support all the all the AWS infrastructure. So if you're using CloudFront for, uh, uh, as, as a CDN, then uh, we have all the different visualizations and dashboards for it. If you're using uh, uh, AWS and you want to monitor CloudTrail, so we also have a few alerts and a few uh, um, uh, also visualization and dashboards. Uh, Nagios, uh, ELB, also S3 access is also very important. We use it internally. Uh, and basically, as you can see, also provide uh, VPC flow. There are hundreds of different applications that different people, some of them developed by us, some of them developed by other people in the community, um, um, actually implemented in this and make it make you work and make you uh, be able to set up a whole ELK system from start to end with in a very, very short period of time, which is the goal of, of what we do. And everything is obviously production ready and everything is, uh, uh, is all set up for you, uh, for you to use. So um, that's what I'm going to show. I want to show you a little bit, uh, some more information about Apache. Uh, if you want uh, all different uh, visualization that we have here to be able to, uh, um, to get information. So, I mean, I can have like access by country, and I can have other stuff both on different uh, different parameters and different products that we use. You see how easy it is to uh, to be able to do it. If I had to build it on my own, I'd have to remember every parameter, what it's called in Apache and how to do it and how to define this and how to set up a pie chart that's going to look like a donut and what's important and what's not important. So all of this, uh, all of this is being saved. Um, Kind of like all of this time is being saved for you, and uh, and basically we we provide it uh, um, we provide it very easy. So uh, that's uh, what I wanted to show. So I want to take some question now, and I do have a little bit, a few questions that kind of came up uh, during the during the presentation. So one question I have is uh, is okay, I built something and I want to participate in the community. How do I contribute back? So if you notice, we've implemented, and this is not part of the default Kibana contribute button into each one of the objects that we have. So whether you have a discovery and you see that there is a contribute button or in the visualization and you have it. So it's very simple. You click contribute, you select the product. Um, this is uh, this is Apache Access and you write a short description. You can select the, how you want it to look. Uh, we intentionally do not grab any information from your environment. So all the information here is canned. So uh, so you wouldn't be at a risk of exposing uh, information that you don't want to. So uh, all you do is, is uh, kind of select a different visualization, write a description. You can also contribute it anonymously. So if you don't want anyone to know that you're behind that, uh, that object, you can do it and then you click publish. All the objects that are being contributed are being uh, verified by us. So we make sure that nothing uh, in there, like in the description, is, is offensive, is unclear, and uh, we make sure it's a valuable uh, object and uh, to a valuable app to the community. And then we approve it, and we, um, we let you know once it's approved. It usually takes between one to two uh, business days. And we, uh, we really appreciate any contribution that, uh, that people do. Because I think this is part of what's uh, what's uh, driving the community. Uh, so, uh, second question is like, how much does it cost? So, all the so uh, it's a very good question. So, Logs.io has a free version with up to one uh, gigabyte a day. 
Uh, and that free version includes the ELK app. So you don't have to be a paying user to be able to take advantage of all the apps that are being developed by us and by the community. It's, it is part of the free uh, version and it, it doesn't cost anything. Uh, another question is, what if I use my own ELK stack? So can I still take advantage of the, uh, of the visualization and everything? So the answer is absolutely. And the way to do it is you sign up with Logs.io. You can either ship log or don't ship logs. It, it really doesn't matter. You can still go to the apps and you see that, uh, that uh, on, on the apps that I don't have logs, uh, on like for example, I don't have CloudFront logs, it's going to say not sending logs. So I can still install it, uh, and it's going to give me a warning saying, in order to take full of that, you need to ship logs first. I can edit anyway uh, to my environment, and then um, then I can go uh, into if I go into the Kibana, and I uh, and I go into the settings here. I have all the visualizations here and I can export them. So for example, uh, Apache access by browser, if I want to take this, I can export it and uh, that kind of like download the file for me and I can import it into my ELK that I'm running somewhere else. Um, so, I mean, obviously we're not, we're, we're not reliable, like if it's going to work or not, we're, we're sure going to be help you if you need, if you need additional help on this. Uh, but sometimes because of change in field types and field names and types themselves, uh, it doesn't mean that it's going to work for every ELK with the data that you ship. But we are here uh, if you do need any help and you, you're more than welcome to kind of set it up and uh, be able to download the visualization and download objects for, from here. So it includes searches, include different dashboards, and you can actually download a whole dashboard uh, for here, from here, which includes all the <clears throat> excuse me, uh, underlying uh, visualizations. Uh, uh, one question, is it possible to customize charge chart legend uh, colors? So the way it's right now, it's not part of the Kibana to be able to customize the chart legend colors. What we did implement is the ability to change the theme. So again, this is not part of the uh, default uh, ELK, but you can, uh, there are two themes here, the, the regular one and the dark theme, and you can choose to do uh, either one, and it does change the internal color, but you cannot customize at this point the, the colors of the graphs. I know they are working on doing something like that, but I, I don't know what, uh, what the data release of it yet. Uh, another question, is Elasticsearch 2.0 supported? So right now we are in the process of upgrading our cluster to uh, Elasticsearch 2.0 and, uh, and the newest Kibana. Uh, it's probably going to take a little bit of time to be able to make sure it's stable. There, is, there has been a lot of changes between the, the latest 1.7 uh, that we're running and Elasticsearch 2.0, especially when it pertains to different types and uh, uh, different uh, visualization. They've also uh, introduced the uh, um, kind of like the pipeline aggregation, which is propagated through Kibana. So this is something that we're currently uh, working on, and once we will have it, we'll release it. Uh, question: Do you have any deal with Elastic to get their commercial plugins? So uh, we are an independent company. So uh, we've implemented a lot of the uh, capabilities that Elastic have on their on their uh, commercial plugins on our own. So we've implemented alerts, which I'm going to show you in a minute. This is not what Elasticsearch implemented with uh, with Watcher. We've implemented high level of security and role based access, which I'm also going to show you in a minute. And this is not part of Shield, but uh, so we've implemented things because it was important for us that the integration is going to be. Uh, throughout Kibana and throughout the user user interface, as opposed to going to the database and writing you know, writing uh, uh, REST and JSON uh, commands. So I want to take two minutes to kind of show you uh, uh, um, about the alerts. So I can do type Apache access, and let's say I want to get alert about response that is uh, not 200. So I can do this, and I can say, you know what, and I want to write this, and response. Uh, to, sorry, 
200 and I'm putting here a minus which saying and I'm interested in anything which is not response to 100. You can see that over the past 15 minutes I had two events like this. I can, uh, with the click of a button, create alerts and saying uh, this is, uh, let's say, too many uh, errors in my GenX and I can decide to run it every hour and I want to make get alerted if this is greater than or equal to 10 because sometimes I get 10 but this is something that I do. Uh, you can write, you can give it an email address and uh, we're also providing uh, at the end of this week we're also providing uh, Slack integration uh, and PagerDuty and a generic webhooks integration so you'll be able to send it up to an auto remediation software that you have and uh, be able to uh, take care of it this way. This again is is um, this is part of Logs.io. This is not something that we charge additional money for, uh, and this is something that uh, that again this is not a not a commercial plugin for Elasticsearch. The second thing is uh, is a role based access, and uh, you can see that we've implemented the user management. So I can add users uh, right now. This is a free account, but I can. Add users in here. Uh, it's unlimited users that we added into the to the pro version. But uh, this is something that, again. This is working on role based access and, and access, and I can decide whether a user can be an admin or a user, and what his requirements and what his access is going to be. Everything is uh, is being done through here. And again, this is not part of the the ELK default ELK. Um, I have another question. Uh, what if I look through the ELK apps and uh, and I don't find what I'm looking for? So uh, if you look for the ELK apps and let's pick something that uh, I know uh, I know we're working on, but we don't have it yet. Let's say MongoDB, uh, and there's nothing in here. So you can you can file here and request it. Uh, we are we are always accumulating requests, and we would let you know once this is implemented. So you can say I would like to see to have Mongo, and once you file the request, then uh, then uh, we get an email, we get a notification, and uh, we where once this is going to be implemented, then we'll let you know, and we're always working on new uh, functionality. The other thing is that uh, if you do have data, like you say you have a data of, of something that we don't provide, we can help you work on the data, build visualizations. We can do it with you, uh, and then you can contribute it back to the community. Again, we're trying to encourage uh, uh, a large community that is supporting one another. We know this is something that was missing from the whole Elasticsearch and the ELK experience to be able to share and collaborate around objects of what do I actually do with this once I get it installed, once I have the logs, uh, uh, logs in there. Um, so I'm going to keep the line open uh, for another few minutes if there are any more uh, questions or anything that you would like me to focus on or, uh, or show you in the product. Uh, so I have a question here. What is the difference between your product and New Relic? So uh, New Relic, uh, and, and by the way, we're also using New Relic internally. So New Relic is is an instrumentation system. So New Relic is, uh, is what's called an, an APM, an application performance management. And what it does is if you're writing in Java or in Ruby, you can instrument your code with New Relic, and it's going to actually tell you where slow things happen and uh, uh, it's going to alert to you whenever you have an exception in the code and stuff like that. Uh, what our product is, it, this is a log analytic system. So there are some similarity. We take our information, we read our information from the logs. Some of them come from infrastructure level components, like same thing that you're, you already collect, like CPU, memory, network, and stuff like that. But some of them also come from proprietary log files. So uh, these are different products that are being used for two different, uh, two different purposes, uh, often time adjacent. So 
New Relic does not have a, uh, a log analytics system, um, and we don't have an instrumentation uh, system. Uh, can I can I use logs.io to store stuff other than log analytic purpose? Um, so that's another question. The, the answer is yes, and it depends on, on what you want to store. So our system is optimized for streaming data. You don't have to use it for log analytics. You can use it. Uh, we have customers that use it for SEO management uh, on the website. We have customers that push uh, Salesforce data into it. We have customers that use Twitter data into it. As long as this is uh, streaming data, that every message has a time and, uh, and the data is kind of moving forward, you can definitely use it. And there is a lot of there are plenty of use cases that that we help and support in this case. Um, if you want to do a static analysis, like you want to build Elasticsearch to provide searching for your website um, or searching for products and stuff like that, if the data is static and doesn't change, then probably Logs.io is not the right the right solution for you. But if this is any of the streaming data, then definitely we have plenty of customers not sending logs and, and leveraging that. Uh, what's the another question is like what is the project uh, projected availability of logs io and so uh, so the answer is uh, and the question is like whether it's 99.99 percent so the answer is that uh, we have like 99.999 percent uh, that we're up and we're measuring it all the time we do have uh, if we do uh, do kind of like major upgrades to the cluster then we usually send out an email beforehand and uh, this does not impact the data ingestion because our pipeline works in a way that we store the data before we ingest it in the pipeline. But uh, but if this is happening in you know, like every few months and we notified about it, we do have a st uh, status page up and running. Um, so uh, if you want to get the status of the system, you can either from outside the system or from the settings, uh, there is a link to our status page and you can see whenever we're up all the issues we've had and uh, and stuff like that. Uh, another question is how is data retention handled? Um, so we handle data retention in uh, in two different ways. So uh, we manage our own indices for you. So we retain all the data, and you can decide once in the purchasing process. Uh, uh, the free versions we provide one gig a day up to three days retention, uh, and the paid one starts with eighty nine dollars a month and starts with fourteen days retention. You can add more. You can yeah uh, to this, and you can add more retention. And we're allocating all the indices for you. If you choose to have like a like a much longer retention, like two years, three years retention, and you donate it in a hot retention way, we provide uh, S3 archiving. Uh, the S3 archiving also this is part of the pro version. You basically define an S3 bucket of your own on AWS, and we make sure to upload all the logs and all the data in a textual format that can be ingested again in the same way uh, to the S3 bucket. The data is being sent to S3 the moment it gets to us, so it's not like we're retaining it for two weeks and then we're sending it there. We're, uh, we're handling the, uh, all the retention in-house, and then uh, in parallel, we send all the data to S3 so you can do it. Uh, we have plenty of customers that for compliance purposes, they have to keep the data for two years and above. Um, but they don't need the data hot. So they use, I don't know, 30 days to 60 days retention with Logs.io, and then they uh, save it in S3, and it's, uh, you can set up retention on S3 and be able to, uh, to address it this way. Okay, so uh, if there are any more questions, I want to thank everybody who joined. So uh, thanks for coming. Uh, we are going to uh, publicize a recording of this. Uh, and, uh, and again, if you do have additional questions, then uh, I am available. And any of the Logs.io uh, uh, employees will also be happy to chat with you and be able to be available for any, to answer any question. So thank you. Thanks again for coming.